Brand new King Killer theory. Let's go. I am so excited because this is a completely original theory. I haven't seen anybody else connect this before. I think I just discovered a secret hidden on the cover of the 10th anniversary edition of The Name of the Wind. It's hidden right in plain sight. It feels very suiting. It makes sense to me and I want to know what you guys think of this theory. It, it's going to take a little bit of explaining. So all of this started when I was doing some research for the book I'm writing. I was looking into the history of alchemy, sacred geometry, the secret teachings of all ages, that kind of stuff. None of which is really relevant. I just wanted to show how you can fall down some very deep rabbit holes while doing writing research because somehow I ended up researching Roman mystery cults, which led me into looking into various Roman artifacts and from that I came across the Boca della Verita. Now if you're a vintage film buff, this face may look familiar to you. The most famous scene in the 1953 film Roman Holiday, starring Gregory Peck and Audrey Hepburn, takes place in the Church of St. Maria in Cosmodon in Rome, Italy. At one point in the film, Peck and Hepburn's characters visit the Boca della Verita, the Mouth of Truth. The legend is that if you're given to lying, you put your hand in there, it'll be bitten off. The underlying significance of the scene is that neither character is what they seem. Peck portrays a conniving journalist pretending to be a regular Joe to get an exclusive on the young woman who is a runaway princess incognito. And this results in the famous scene where Peck pretends that his hand was chewed off. While this was part of the script, we get the genuine surprise reaction of Hepburn when he hides his hand in his sleeve to show her the remaining stump. This was an improvised prank on the actress and you can see her genuine reaction as she starts to laugh when she holds him. Just bear with me, this is gonna connect to the King Killer Chronicle. Just be patient. The marble stone mask that is the mouth of truth was first recorded as a chastity or fidelity test in 1450 and had become a general lie detector by 1800. And droves of expectant tourists line up to this day to test their hands at it, including many celebrities. Even Sigmund Freud once made an oath with the stone to return again to the city. Now tourists, Freud included, have participated in the animistic myth that regarded this massive relic of antiquity as a terrible demon who cautioned against lying on pain of amputation. Superstitions like this became wildly popular during the Middle Ages, but it's ironic that this myth still continues to prosper because while the Baca condemns the lies of others, it refuses to give up its own secrets. Despite its worldwide fame, we really know next to nothing about the original meaning of the Mouth of Truth. Archaeologists unsatisfied with Roman folklore have attempted to identify the face on the marble disc as Jupiter, Mercury, the Nile, a fawn, and even a totem of a man-eating lion from Asia Minor. Though the most accepted theory is that this face depicts the Greek titan Oceanus, and that the famous lie detector was actually originally a drain cover for a temple dedicated to Hercules. Over time, it was changed to a lie detector, whether that be a white lie or a terrible one, you lose your hand to the all-knowing truth. I could see somebody putting this in the center of their town to try and make their community more honest. Now, not all that info and history was relevant, I just found it interesting. But let's talk about for a moment how this looks very similar to the face on the 10th anniversary edition of The Name of the Wind. You can't tell me, there isn't a resemblance. And it's interesting that this face is placed on a pillar. In Paris, there's a famous statue depicting a woman placing her hand in the mouth, and this is also placed on a pillar. It makes me wonder if the cover artist, Sam Weber, gained inspiration from the Mouth of Truth, or maybe even consulted with Patrick Rothfuss. And if so, it's possible this holds importance with the story. We know the Chandrian are drawn to those who speak their true names, but could there be more to this? Maybe the Chandrian are required to punish anyone who spreads lies about them or lies about the history of the Creation War and its aftermath. Cinder, representing the mouth of truth, is depicted above a smashed lute. This would suggest that the song sung about them, the song that Arladin, Quoth's father wrote, was a lie. Someone's parents have been singing entirely the wrong sort of songs. Now that I've connected the cover with the Mouth of Truth, let's branch out and connect this with some other theories. 
We know that verita means truth, and Merriam-Webster defines the Latin word veritas as truth is mighty, its origin coming from the Roman goddess of truth. Now you may notice veritas is commonly used in the motto of several universities, such as Harvard. And in the heart of the archives of the university, there's a four-plate door, and it has the word Veleritas carved into it, which is quite similar to Veritas. It's likely this word is related to truth. This mysterious door in the university is locking away the truth. Almost to taunt Quoth and the reader, the answers we want could be hidden behind this door. Could it contain books that detail the true story of the Chandrian and their motivation, or the real history of the Creation War? I'll also point out that the word Valer means to surround with stone, so Valeritas could be related to the Doors of Stone instead. One of Kingkiller's overriding themes is how myths and stories grow, and the complex intermingling between truth and fiction, how stories can warp and change when being told over time. This means Scarpy's story could likely be incorrect or warped in some way, but it's this story that reminds Quoth of his terrible encounter with the Chandrian and sets him off towards the university. Now, throughout the Kingkiller Chronicle, Quoth is driven by his revenge. We see evidence of this in the name of the wind, where he hears talk of blue fire at the Mothen farm and suddenly forgets all of his worries and violently threatens a horse trader before riding the horse hard for 60 miles miles in order to get to Trabin and investigate. The Chandrian killed his troop, and he believes the story told by Scarpy that Lanray was a hero who fell and became Haliax, the leader of the Chandrian and betrayed the legendary hero Celatos. Now just because Quoth believes this story to be true doesn't mean that it is the correct history. It's very likely he could be blinded and even being manipulated by some other force. As we know, Denna has a different story, as we see in her Song of Seven Sorrows. This song is the result of extensive research done by Denna and her patron, and is based on a version she found in an old book. The song contradicts Scarpy's story about Lanray being a traitor. In this version, Lanray is the tragic hero, who was betrayed by Celatos. Both versions of the story have Celatos placing a curse on Lanray, but in Denna's version, Lanray's not the villain. Celatos is the one with cruel and biting words. The thing is, we don't know which version is right. It could be possible Quoth is being fed lies. The truth is being concealed, just like with what's behind the door in the archives. The Chandrian don't just kill people because they have knowledge of their true names. Look at the Mothin Farm Massacre. The Vays didn't have any info on their names that we know of. Instead, I think they're trying to cut out lies about the Creation War and its aftermath. Or possibly, they're trying to conceal that part of history to prevent anyone else from contacting Eax. Eax, or Jax, was a powerful shaper who made contact with the Cathay. Going against the Knowers, the shapers wanted a place to practice their skill unhindered, so they created the Fane Realm. After doing this, each shaper built a star which they placed into the empty sky. However, unsatisfied with only a star, the greatest shaper, Eax, used his ability to pull the moon into the Fae, causing it to phase between both worlds. And this was the act that sparked the Creation War. And as we know, during the war, the Knowers, including Lanray and Lyra, sealed Eax behind the Doors of Stone. So Eax appears to be one of the biggest threats there is in this universe, along with the Cathay. It's safe to assume it would be pretty worrisome if someone were to free him from his prison, or open themselves up to being influenced by him. Now it's very likely that Lanray was influenced by Eax while trying to seal him behind the doors of stone. Or more specifically, Eax has a skin dancer that hitched a ride. After all, in the story of Jax told by Hesp, she mentions that some say he had a demon riding his shadow. And in the Waystone Inn, Coates tells us that skin dancers are supposed to look like a dark shadow or smoke when they leave. According to Scarpy, and again, Scarpy's story likely holds inaccuracies, Lanray died in the process of shutting away Eax and was revived by Lyra, but he later became Haliax when Lyra dies, and he sought knowledge better left alone. Knowledge from the Cathay, the same entity that Eax contacted before messing the world up. Now I should note that Eax is the last three letters of Haliax, and Hal is the Latin word for breath. 
So Haliax loosely translates to the Breath of Eax. The skin dancer from Eax transferred over to Haliax. Now Haliax also seems to have connections to the moon, as described on the piece of pottery recovered from the Mothin farm. Now there is another detail I need to point out. Bast mentions a skin dancer can make you pull out your own eye. Who is the only character we know that's done this? Celatos. I think Celatos was possessed by a skin dancer that danced out of Eax and into Lanray. Maybe Lanray was never even corrupted until Celatos put the curse on him. I really don't buy the idea that Celatos is good. His Amir are motivated by revenge alone. They are above the law and act for the greater good. And this is easily a corruptible mindset. Look at the Duke of Gabia, for example, who did horrific medical experiments. Now also, just theorizing here, but I think that skin dancers could be acting as the eyes and ears of the Cathay. They're the way this creature is able to pull the strings in the human world. After all, we know the Scythe, the ones who keep people from talking to the Cathay, are said to have skill in hunting skin dancers. Because they don't want this monster to have any influence over anything. Now if it is true that the Chandrian are destroying lies about them, or possibly preventing knowledge that could lead to the release of Eax, then I think we can safely assume that Scarpy's story is not accurate. If it were, he would have been killed a long time ago. Arladin succeeded in linking Lanray to the Chandrian before the troop is killed, and Scarpy does the exact same thing, so you would think it would be easy to track him. Now it could be that Scarpy is protected by the Amir. The Amir had affiliation with the church for a long time, and Scarpy says that he has friends in the church. So that is a possibility. It's hard to say exactly what Eax is or what would happen if he was freed from his prison, but we know that his power is equal to or greater than Celatos and Lyra. We know this because Celatos and Lyra fought on the same side and it still took them hundreds of years to bind Eax. With all the foreshadowing and the clues, the story seems to be leading us to the idea that Kvoth is going to open the doors of stone and mess everything up. And this was an idea that was likely planted in him by the Cathay. During his encounter with the Cathay, the creature bound to the tree seems to be playing a beautiful game. He's setting Kvoth up to go after Cinder. Specifically, it seems to be linking Cinder to Dena's patron. And while I do think there is reason to believe that Dena's patron could be Cinder in disguise, I think it's more likely the Cathay is planting this connection in order to sabotage Kvoth and cause as much chaos as he can. Personally, I don't think her patron actually is Cinder. Now why does the Cathay want him chasing the Chandrian? Well, it mentions that maybe this Cinder did him a bad turn once. I mentioned in a previous video the idea that the Cathay is actually Encanus and is bound to his wheel that's now inside of a tree. And maybe Cinder literally turned the wheel at some point. It also could be that Haliax and the Chandrian are rebelling against the Cathay and preventing anyone from releasing Eax so that the Cathay's chaotic poison can't spread any further. That's a theory, anyway. We know the Cathay is poisonous, and we know the betrayers of the Seven Cities were poisoned by the enemy, so it stands to reason that the Chandrian are the betrayers, and were poisoned after Lanray contacted the Cathay. They've been bitten or altered in some way. Now when Kvoth returns to Felurian, broken by the Cathay, she makes a point of examining him to see if he was bitten. She concludes that he wasn't, but what if she's wrong? Now I have a whole theory about Kvoth being possessed by a skin dancer, but I'll go into that in a future video, since this one is going a bit off track. But whether Kvoth was bitten by the Cathay, or has a skin dancer, I come to the conclusion that the Cathay achieved its purpose with Kvoth. He evoked the horror of the troops' massacre, and then added fuel to Kvoth's anger of Cinder by tying him to Dena's patron. We know that he's responsible for the current civil war in the frame story because, you know, he killed a king as well as an angel, he's likely going to be opening the doors of stone in book 3, and everything else. He's now waiting to die just like how Haliax is hoping for death. Okay, I branched off a lot with this theory, but to go back to my original theory, linking the cover to the Mouth of Truth. Now the Chandrian do not like people singing the wrong sorts of songs, and they must have reasoning for this, other than just trying to destroy evidence of their names. 
While the Chandrian are clearly not good, they could fall in a grey zone, where they don't want information getting out that will lead to Eax being freed, so they need to strike whenever this information starts to spread. If Eax is set free, it's likely going to cause catastrophe, and it's most likely that's what's happened in the frame story, and why everything seems to be in chaos. I want to know what you think of the idea of the Chandrian hunting down these lies about them, that maybe the history that we're learning is not exactly the truth. Do you believe in Scarpy's story or Denna's song? Do you think the Cathay is playing a beautiful game with Quoth and is setting him up for tragedy. Let me know what other king killer thing you want to see me make a video on, and a big thank you to all of my patrons. I've been able to make videos faster because of you, and I appreciate that so much, uh, and I'll see you guys next time.